We're going to look at another company now using the website app Stock Glasses. This is Angie Home Services, ticker ANGI. This is a company that provides an online platform for people to hire contractors to come out and do home improvement work, maintenance, landscaping, and things of that nature. Now their price right now is $5.49. As you can see, very low on their 52-week and 5-year range, so they're very badly beaten down which may present an opportunity at this time. So we're going to look at this company further now to see if that might be the case. Price to book is 2.1. Again, we want to compare this to peers and their sector average to see if it's relatively low or high. Free cash flow for the most recent quarter is 18 million. Nice positive number. Net income for the most recent quarter is negative, unfortunately, 107,000. The current assets to debt is 0.88, and the total assets to debt is 3.36. These are pretty good numbers, and we have to remember it's extremely important to find companies right now that have very strong balance sheets. Because of the pandemic situation, revenues are going to be lower than usual, business is going to be slower, and companies are going to be fighting to keep from going bankrupt. So the companies that are going to survive are going to be the ones that have very strong balance sheets, sheets that can weather the storm and have enough cash and liquid assets on hand to cover their obligations. So let's continue looking at this company now. Their revenue is steadily increasing over 2016 to 2019. That's good to see. Net income is wavering but generally on an upwards trend and positive most recently. That's okay. Free cash flow is on an upwards trend and mostly positive for the years 2017 to 2019. So that's good. We at least know they're not losing money. Angie Home Services, as we said, is a holding company which engages in the provision of digital marketplaces for home services. Now, they're a holding company because they own a number of different businesses, and they have th three that I saw were the most important or main ones, at least the ones that they covered the most and focused in the annual report. And that is Home Advisor, Angie's List, and Handy. These are other businesses that they own, and they also have a European segment uh, with these businesses here. The company was founded in 2017 and is headquartered in Denver, Colorado. Here's their website. You can go there to read SEC filings, which I have done and read their latest annual report for the fiscal year 2019. So moving right on down the line here, their price to book is above the sector average, above the sector average on their price to earnings, price to sales, and price to cash flow. Remember, these are just starting points. We want to continue to investigate this company further if we're still interested in it because the real research and the real information we're going to find that's important is going to be through reading their SEC filings and looking at their management and exploring their business in more detail. Value, they're valued currently at $2.7 billion. Their balance sheet, as we suspected, looks healthy. Their current assets is $500 million, and their current debt is $215 million. Current assets are assets that are more liquid in nature, like cash and cash equivalents, Debt is Current debt is debt that is due within one year. So they are, have more than enough assets to cover their current debt uh, over double, and their total assets, which are assets that are more long-term in nature, like their property, plant, and equipment, and it also includes their current assets, by the way, is $1.9 billion. Their total debt, which is debt including short-term and long-term debt, is $571 million. So they are in a great, they're in great shape. Uh, if they need to draw on further cash, if they run out of cash, which I'm not sure, I'm not sure how likely it is, but they would have to blow through a lot to, to do that, then they have these assets they could potentially sell to get more cash to keep them afloat. This looks very good here. Healthy balance sheet. Operating cash flow is $32 million, good positive number. CapEx is about half that, which is not bad. Free cash flow is $18 million, so at the end of the day, as we saw, they're not losing money. Good positive number here. That's what we want to see. Continuing down, their business CEO is Brandon Ridnor, and I had trouble finding some things on him online. I wanted to find more interviews to watch and listen to him speak about things, um, but I couldn't find too much, at least right off the bat. You generally want to look at the CEO of the company and sort of get a feel for what kind of person they are and if it's someone that you would want running a company that you own. So continuing on down, connects quality home service professionals across 500 different categories from repairing, remodeling, to cleaning and landscaping with consumers. They have 250,000 domestic service professionals. These are contractors. 
more than 25 million projects each year from consumers. That's a very good number to see. That means that people are using their service a lot. Two operating sectors, North America and Europe. We'll look at more at this a little later and see how much of their business is in North America and how much of it is in Europe. September 29th of 2017, Home Advisor and Angie's List combined into what we now know as Angie Home Services. These were two companies that were uh, relatively well known, I believe. I was more familiar with Angie's List from the past as a place to go to to look up reliable reviews on companies and services that you're interested in using. North American brands, Home Advisor, Angie's List, and Handy. These are the three main brands that were focused on in the annual report. They do own a number of other companies, but there wasn't really much said about them, maybe a little bit about fixed repair. So I'm not too sure about the details of these and what services they provide or anything really uh, in-depth about them. The annual report just didn't seem to really mention them that much. But they do own these. These are their European companies. Uh, so we're going to focus on basically what the annual report described about these three main brands that they have. So let's start with Home Advisor. They're providing contractors for home repair, maintenance, and home improvement. And they provide consumers with tools and resources to help them find local, pre-screened, and customer-rated service of professionals. This is important. This is a, a pretty valuable service they're providing because normally what you'd want to do if you were hiring a contractor to do work for you is get find out about them through word of mouth, whether through your friends or other people that you trust, so that you know that the person that you're inviting to your home to do the work, but also be around your family and, and your loved ones, is, is going to be someone that you can trust and will do a good job, etc. So this company provides you with pre-screening so that you at least know that they are not criminals with some violent felony background. They do a background check on them. And in addition to that, you can look at other customer reviews of them in the past to see if they are rated highly and you can expect them to do a good job or not. So this is a pretty valuable service here. It saves you a lot of work up front and it gives you a uh, place to find someone if you don't have anybody that can recommend to some, you to someone uh, by word of mouth. So online and connect them. So they they provide the option to connect with them online or by telephone. I think their primary service is uh, their online platform. And let's look at Angie's List just really quickly. It connects consumers with service professionals for local services, valuable tools, services, and content including verified reviews to help them research shop and hire local services. I'm more familiar with Angie's List as a place to go to find trusted reviews. So, but it looks like they're also doing something similar to Home Advisor, which is you can then hire out these service professionals and contractors. Handy is a relatively recent acquisition acquired in October of 2018. They're a leading platform for connecting individuals looking for household services, cleaning and handyman services primarily with pre-screened and top quality independent contractors. Now this is a very, this was a very good call on their part and we're going to see that it contributed to a significant portion of their revenue in 2019. I mean who doesn't need a handyman to come by and fix things on occasion or more often than not maybe. So this provides people with an easy to use online service to get them connected with someone when they need projects that perhaps are smaller in scope from the projects that would be handled by Home Advisor or Angie's List contractors, say uh, home repair and landscaping and things of that nature. So moving on, these companies, as we said, uh, we don't know much about right now. Fixed Repair is another company that they acquired in January of 2019. It's a home warranty and service company. I wasn't able to find out too much about the company. It wasn't mentioned that often in the annual report, and there was more information given about these other brands that they own. Looking at their revenue now, how do they make money? Where, what are their revenue sources? Home Advisor and Handy are big revenue sources for them. How it works is they, the consumers uh, pay a fee for matching to a customer for their services. I'm sorry, not the consumers, the contractors. They pay a fee for matching to a customer 
And uh, this platform provides them a way to connect with potential customers. So they, instead of them, the contractors, having to go knocking from door to door finding customers, the customers can go to this platform, which is relatively well known, and find them. So when they do get found and they get connected, Angie, serv Angie Home Services is a middleman, as we mentioned before. They connect these two parties, and the contractor pays Angie Home Services a fee for this service. And this is paid whether they complete the job or not. So this is just for getting them connected in the first place. Now, their service they also have service professional memberships and subscriptions to the service that contractors can sign up for. So continuing on their Angie's List revenue, advertising fees from service professionals who want to advertise there, and subscriptions from consumers, these are customers now, not the contractors, who want to subscribe to this service and find contractors uh, more easily. The revenue results for the year 2019 1.3 billion dollars in total. This is a 17 percent increase from 2018. As we mentioned before, they have North American and European segments. The vast majority of their business comes from the North American segment, 94 percent. Only 6 percent of the revenue comes from their European brands. Now this proportion did not change from 2000 to 2018 to 2019, so it does not appear, at least in the relatively recent past, that they are expanding more in Europe or have plans to do that. I didn't, don't remember reading that in their latest annual report. So this proportion will most likely stay the same, and most of their business is going to be focused in North America. Their revenue increase, they mention, is at least partly in due to the revenue that was generated by Handy, which they acquired, as we saw, in I believe it was October 2018. So this was a very good call acquiring that company. They are generating profit, and it is, uh, again, providing a service that a lot of people probably could use and really want. So that is a good company for them to own. The Consumer Connection, 70% of revenue comes from connecting consumers with contractors, and that's up 30% from 2018. 20% of their revenue comes from advertising, and that's down negative 8% from 2018. So their majority of their revenue is coming from these connections. They're connecting people who need a service to these contractors, and both parties are, are paying for this service so that they are mutually, it's mutually benefiting both parties and making things, making their connection easier. Their gross profit, their operating income after their cost of operations was 38.6 million. That is decreased from 40% from 2018. This is not really what we want to see. That's not a great number. So we're going to have to keep an eye on this and say, why did this happen? And is this something we need to be concerned with? Their EBITDA, which is earnings before interest, depreciation, taxes, and amortization. Uh, a funny thing, Charlie Munger calls this bullshit earnings, uh, incidentally, which I find sort of humorous. Uh, that may be a topic of discussion we could talk about in the comments later, but essentially, let's just go over this. EBITDA is $202 million, which is a decrease, decrease of 18% from 2018. That's not really what we want to see. We want to see that earnings are, are increasing. This is related to net income, their profit. Uh, I made a little note here. Net income seems to be wavering over 2016 to 2019. However, the revenues appear to be steadily rising. So it's not, it's not a terrible situation. Uh, ideally, we'd want to see that the company is consistently profitable. But if revenues continue to rise as they have been, let's look at the graph real quick up here, you see this, they're just continually going up. If that continues, then we can be reasonably sure, or at least our concerns could be alleviated, that their net income is going to remain positive because their revenue is continually increasing. Now that, of course, depends on the costs and all of that. So we'll keep looking at this further to see if we see any red flags that might cause concern for the future of that. The decrease in profit, they mentioned, is due to a higher marketing expenses, increase in debt expenses, investments in fixed and handy segments. 
uh, I think that's okay because we want to see companies investing in their products and their services to make them better and draw more customers and in the long run make more money. But this is something that we're going to have to look at here. It seems to me that they have very high marketing expenses and the annual report addresses this and acknowledges this and we'll look at that a little bit later shortly here. Service requests from consumers, 27 million. That's up 17% from 2018. This is good. This is what we want to, want to see. This is people that are looking for services and using the platform to connect them with contractors. This correlates with the overall revenue increase. The revenue increase overall, I believe, was about 18%. So their revenue is going to be dependent on how many consumers, at least looking at this right here, use their service and make service requests to get connected to contractors. This looks good. It, that number is increasing, which is what we want to see. Paying service providers. These are the contractors. 220,000 contractors, up 3% from 2018. This is a small, much smaller percent of increase in growth from their consumers, but... I think, as we saw, their majority of their revenue comes from service requests from customers. So this is the number that's probably more important, although they do generate revenue from their contractors that use their service as well. But we really, the numbers are really heavy on the consumer side as far as affecting, having the most effect on their revenue. So, uh, as I note here, appears to be less of a source of revenue compared to requests from consumers through HomeAdvisor and Handy. What are their costs? Their costs of revenue for 2019 were 46 million, which is a decrease from 17% of 2018 due to the sale of a Felix segment. I don't know much about Felix, but apparently it was a brand that they sold. And uh, they uh, reaped some of the benefit of that. Uh, there was a decrease in costs from letting go of that company, at least the cost of revenue. Other costs of revenue are credit card processing fees, compensation expense, and other employee-related costs at fixed repair. There was quite a bit of talk about stock-based compensation, and some of it sort of went over my head or in here and out the other, one ear and out the other. It's something that you may want to look at closer. I just noticed that it was uh, pretty, it took up a substantial percentage of what was in the annual report, uh, discussions of this, this stock-based compensation. Uh, other costs include hosting fees and traffic acquisition costs. Let's look at their sell selling and marketing expenses. This is uh, the big one here. $733 million, which is 55% of their revenue. That seems like a very high percentage of the money that you're bringing in. Uh, it increased 35% from 2018 due mostly to increased online and television marketing expenses. So they are paying through the nose, it looks like, to do this advertising. And, you know, there's one argument that we could consider, which says that's a good thing. They're getting the word out there. And by doing that, the more people that know about them, the more people will use their service and their revenues will increase in the long run. And that's a valid argument. But I'm still, I mean, ideally, when you're looking for a business, you want to find a business that, that keeps its costs low in comparison to their revenue. So th this, this may not be horrible, but it's also not ideal in what you want to see. And keep in mind, this is only this segment of the cost. Remember, there's an additional 17% of revenue that's being eaten up by cost of revenue up here, and an additional 26% of revenue that's being eaten up by general and administrative. So we already have what here is, uh, what, 36, uh, 40, 43%, almost half of their revenue, and then over half of their revenue in selling and marketing, that's almost their total revenue eaten up by these expenses. So this is something that sort of raises a red flag for me personally. So now that we've looked at the costs a bit and explored some of the concerns that we might find there, let's keep going down here. Um, their latest update, they had a, an update on April 15th of this year, very recent. And they made a, an adjustment of their guidance, which is their expectations for their performance in the first quarter of 2020. Their revenue, they expect to be 340 to 345 million. Their operating cash flow is 15 to 20 million. That's actually not, not too far off from their operating cash flow for their most recent quarter, which is 18 million. So this is actually not looking too bad. Excuse me, adjusted EBITDA 
in the range of 30 to 35 million dollars. This does seem good in comparison to recent quarters, even with the pandemic situation. So these numbers, if they're correct, remember this is just a guidance, this is what they're expecting, but if they turn out to be the case, then it looks like they're not going to have that bad of a first quarter, which is say, really saying something, given the, the current situation. As of March 31st, 2020, they have $384 million in cash and cash equivalents. They have $244 million of debt, mostly due in November of 2023, which is a good ways off. That's two years from now. So I think they're going to be pretty okay in the short term. They, As we saw, they have a very healthy balance sheet. I think they're well positioned to weather the storm under the current pandemic situation, assuming it doesn't get totally out of hand and, and things don't last much longer than expected. But they seem like they're in a very good spot right now financially. Uh, and they believe that they have ample access to capital to navigate the current and coming economic pressures. This is These are very reassuring uh, numbers and words from the management at Angie Home Services, given the recent situation. Let's go on to the risks and tailwinds. They have high advertising costs. The company is trying to make changes to the process to reduce costs. They do mention this specifically in their annual letter. They are trying to find ways of reducing these sales and marketing costs, which we saw were so high just recently looking at the costs. Question is, will this be effective? Are these processes going to work? They didn't go into detail what these processes are. So if they don't work, then we can count on very high costs still eating up a majority of the revenue that's brought in. Slowing revenue growth. From 2016 to 2019, we have 128% growth, which is phenomenal. 53%, very great as well. Then it uh, spirals down to 17% growth, which is still good. It's just in comparison to the growth they had. Uh, this is this is just basically on a continual downwards trend as far as the revenue growth goes. Um, that's not necessarily a terrible thing. Uh, they could, could still continue to grow revenue. We, we probably cannot expect it to continue growing at these rates, though. Uh, the coronavirus pandemic has negative effects, at least in the short term. However, as we look at their balance sheet, they're probably going to be okay. So this is probably a low risk. Contractors may not want to come in contact with customers because they're worried about catching the virus. I think this is unlikely personally because they need to make money. They need to stay afloat as well. So they're going to take jobs and uh, service requests as they come in through the platform so that they can pay their bills. Consumers, on the other hand, who are hiring contractors may not want to bring people to their homes and have them do work because they don't want to catch the virus from them. Uh, I think this is more of a risk because I, people are probably going to put off home, home improvement or recreational type services that they need. And they're only going to be hiring contractors, I would imagine, for essential repairs and maintenance that need to be done immediately that are vital and um, really um, you know, important for them to complete in, in the near term. So that's probably going to reduce the number of service requests they get. This is speculation on my part. I'm just sort of trying to, uh, you know, see, imagine how things might play out given the situation. Tailwinds. Good call on the acquisition of Handy. This is a good company they own now. It's providing good revenue for them and contributing to their revenue growth. Their balance sheet is very healthy. This is really what we want to see in companies that we're looking at right now. And since the work is contracted, they can continue to operate under the pandemic conditions. They don't have offices where they necessarily have to close down that are dependent. The customers don't go to their office. The customers use their online platform to hire these contractors, and the contractors don't go to their office either. The contractors go to the residences, the residencies of these people who are hiring them. So they don't really need to have their brick and mortar uh, offices open during this pandemic, I would imagine. They can continue operating because their primary base of operations is basically virtual and online. So that gives them advantage over other companies that have to close down because of the pandemic situation. Uh, let's do an overall summary now and look at the key positives and negatives. Key positives are their business model mostly hires contractors. It saves the company the cost of full-time employment benefits and costs from having, say, W-2 employees, where they would have to pay health insurance and all of these things. So they have a low cost of, of, uh, 
of uh, their staff because a lot of the people who work for them don't work for them. They work through them and then pay them fees for the service of connecting them to other customers. They're good. They have a, had a good acquisition of Handy and their buyback of shares at a price higher than the current valuation indicates that management may value the company at a higher price than it's currently valued. There were quite a few SEC filings of management doing share buybacks and a lot of the prices that I saw were well above $5. I think they were in the $7 range, at least the ones that I saw. They provide a widely needed and desired service for homeowners and businesses that need maintenance. And they have assets that cover their debt obligations by a healthy margin. Their moat, one-stop shop to find a handyman or home repair Maintenance services, the company vets their contractors up front, saving the consumer the time that it would take to do that. And they also uh, have reviews so that the consumer can find if they're a trustworthy contractor or not. <clears throat> Key negatives, high sales and marketing costs currently. This could decrease in 2020 with the new processes that are implemented, as they mention in their annual report. But will they be effective and result in the same or better advertising with lower costs? Their revenue growth looks like it is slowing. It's still on an upwards trend, but we can't expect the same year-over-year -year growth as we've seen at least in the last four years. Going the, they're going to be hurt by the coronavirus pandemic, at least in the short term. However, uh, as we saw, they have a good balance sheet. They're probably going to survive this and eventually be back on their feet. And their quarter one update also looked actually not bad at all. So overall, I think they're pretty good. They're going to have revenue from providing connecting services that are desired and needed by homeowners to maintain their properties. And uh, However, it could be a while until the business is firing on all cylinders, uh, depending on the recovery after the pandemic is under control. So as with all things, it's not without risk. However, overall, uh, they seem like a very solid business with numbers that are nothing to laugh at, and they are also in a position to weather the storm of the current pandemic situation. So I would definitely be curious about your thoughts on the company, what you think, if you think there are other risks or tailwinds that I've missed. Let's talk about it more and, and uh, let's see what we can learn from each other. If you have any other requests about other companies you'd like me to take a look at, put them in the comments as well and we can look at those as well. This is a pretty hot time to be doing that with the market going all over the place. Hope you enjoyed this and see you in the next one.